Would the children like to come and John Vogel song? <laughs> come on, I need you. I'll help you get back up. Well, you want to sit in my stool, actually, you can do that. That'd be easier for it. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. Sit in the stool would be easier for me. Now, all you children are really strong, right? Okay. Which one of you is the strongest? All of you. <laughs> you want a tractor pulling contest? You pulled a tractor? Wow. A trophy. Wow. Okay. Well, we're going to pick one of you. All right. You all think about a number between 1 and 10. Any number you want between 1 and 10. You have it in your mind? Hmm? You have a number between 1 and 10? Who picked 9? You did. Okay. Come on. Here. Now, since you told me you're nice and strong, you're going to pick him up and hold him. You think you can do that? No, no. How about if I get a couple helpers? You think we can do that? You stay sitting right there, John. You're doing fine. Should have picked someone smaller than John. <laughs> Should have picked Logan. <laughs> come on, come over and help me. Now, you guys, you're going to grab a hold of him. Grab a hold of that leg. Someone grab a hold of this arm. Someone grab a hold of this arm. You think? All right. You ready? One, two, three. There, we picked him up. Now, what did we learn? That one by one by one by one, we can't. We can't do some things, but when we're all together in a group, we can. One of the reasons God brings us to church is because together we can do things that by ourselves we cannot do. And it's a valuable lesson. All of those folks out there help us. They make us stronger. Because we're stronger together than we are by ourselves. And that's the lesson we need to learn about the church. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you this day for who you are. Thank you for the lessons that we can learn together. We ask for your blessing upon our children today. They are so precious in your sight and in our eyes as well. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Okay, you may go back to your seats. You too, John. Next time, remind me to pick someone smaller than John. <laughs> yeah, you're smaller than John. <laughs>If you have your Bible today, turn there to Acts chapter 4. We're going to actually expand our reading a little bit. Robin printed what I had given her, but I decided that I'd like to begin reading with verse 23 instead of verse 27. And we will read from verse 23 to verse 37, which is the end of the chapter. Acts chapter 4. And beginning with verse 23, last week we looked at a story in this same chapter, but earlier in the chapter, and this is now the conclusion of that chapter. Acts chapter 4 and beginning with verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you have made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you appointed. They did 
what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was with them all. There were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. May God's blessing be added to the reading and the hearing of his word. On Friday, I went and had lunch with a friend of mine who I haven't seen in a seven or eight or nine months, something like that. We talk on the phone occasionally, but we just hadn't been in each other's presence for a while. I wanted to have lunch with him to thank him for being my friend and for the many things that he's done for me over the years, and he has. My friend and I used to golf together. I was never a very good golfer, and he was an excellent golfer. Now, most of the time, if you're not a very good golfer, you don't want to golf with someone who is excellent because it makes you feel bad. But my friend was never that way. He was and still is an encourager. When I used to golf, my goal was to shoot below 100. And I could do that on a pretty consistent basis if I played on a regular basis. My friend's goal was to hit par. 72, most places. He could get it most of the time, and for, quite frequently, he was in the upper 60s. Now, a guy who's shooting in the upper 60s and a guy who's shooting in the upper 90s don't normally want to play golf with each other. I loved playing with my friend because he was an encourager. When I would get up to the tee, he would help to guide me. Mike, your feet are too far apart. Or Mike, your, your, your club is heading towards the out of bounds. Or, you know, he would say just not condescendingly to me, but encouraging to me. If and when I made a nice shot, he'd be the first to say, Mike, that was terrific. Now remember what you did and do it again. Like that was going to happen. When I'd get up on the green, finally, and I'd had the putter in my hand, he'd say, Mike, that's not a four-inch diameter hole, it's a bushel basket. It was pleasurable playing golf with him because he was an encourager. Joseph, a man from Cyprus, gets his name changed to Barnabas because he was a son of encouragement. When I was a new pastor in the conference many, many years ago, I met with Dr. Baldosser, and some of you remember Ken Baldosser very well. I met with Dr. Baldosser, and I was the only new pastor in the conference that year for a few months, and then another brother joined me, and we met with Dr. Baldosser, and one of the things that he did was tell us about the conference and what the conference had to offer and what his role was and all of those kinds of things. And Dr. Baldosser, his title was superintendent of the East Pennsylvania Conference. He said to me, Mike, now, now my job in some denominations would be called bishop. He said, I've never been called bishop. I have been called son of a bishop. He said, at least I think that's what they said. <laughs> you ever seen the t-shirt? My daddy was a pistol. 
and I'm a son of a gun. What do you want to be called? I want to suggest to you there's nothing better than to be called a son or a daughter, as the case may be, of encouragement. Everybody loves to be encouraged. Everybody loves when someone walks up and, 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 and pats you on the shoulder and says, that's a beautiful pink shirt, John. You should wear pink more often. It makes you look good. Everybody loves it when somebody says something nice or comes up and encourages you and say, hey, I realize you're trying hard. You might not have achieved everything you wanted to do yet, but you're making improvements. Don't we love that when someone comes alongside us? Correspondingly, isn't it disgusting when we sometimes watch a sporting event and we see somebody in someone else's face deriding them, making fun of them, all of those kinds of things. Barnabas. We don't know whether he ever preached a sermon or not. Perhaps not. It doesn't matter. He's a son of encouragement. He's an encourager to others. He comes alongside to help them with words of encouragement. When I was in high school, you always had a little bit of time after you were done eating lunch and before the bell rang to go to your next class. And you hung out in the lobby of the school. It's not good things happened there on occasion. There was a boy in our school who wasn't all that he should have been. Talked into his Dick Tracy watch, and he didn't have a Dick Tracy watch. He was being mainstreamed into the classes. He wore double knit slacks, remember? the day, long past when double-knit slacks were okay to wear. On this particular day, this young man was standing over there by himself, probably talking to his Dick Tracy watch. He didn't really have any friends because no one wanted to hang with him. And one of the hoods went over and flicked their Zippo lighter and held it up against his pant leg. And of course, that double knit material just immediately melted right into his skin, burning a big hole in his pants. It obviously had to hurt. My friends and I decided we were going to go confront the hood. You know, with enough of us, we were okay to do that. But a girl in my class beat us to it. Her name was Tara. And Tara threw shot put and discus on the women's track team. And, and she went over and grabbed a hold of the hood by the front of his shirt, jacked him up against the wall that his feet were about this far off the floor. <laughs> and she had her fist pulled back just like this, and I happened to catch her arm because she was going to nail him. Not that he didn't deserve it. But his head was against a brick wall. And I said, Tara, you can hit him. She said, oh, yeah, I can. <laughs> I said, I think he's learned his lesson. Suddenly, the hood wasn't a hood anymore. And all of us guys had a lot of respect for Tara. <laughs> Son of encouragement. A number of years ago, not in this church, but in one of the churches I served, a, a gentleman came out the line one Sunday morning and shook my hand and said, This was lousy. I got nothing out of this today. 
I said, hey, thanks a lot. What did you give? And he said, what I put in the offering plate between me and the Lord. I said, I don't care a hoot about what you put in the offering plate. I want to know what did you give today in this service? Did you come in here with a clean mind and a clean heart and open yourself before the Lord and say, Lord, speak to me today? Or did you come in here predetermined that you were in a bad mood and you were going to affect everybody else you could with your bad mood? And he left. And later that week he called me and said, Pastor, I need to apologize. What do you want to be known as? A grumbler? A complainer? The nastiest person ever? Or an encourager? As I said, I don't know whether Barnabas ever preached a sermon. I don't know that he ever taught a Sunday school lesson. In fact, I'm pretty sure he didn't do that because that's really a much more modern invention. I know that he traveled along with the apostles and the disciples and he was an encourager. Remember Ziggy, the cartoon character? Some of you are old enough to remember Ziggy. Maybe some of you are so old you don't remember Ziggy. That happens too. Ziggy, the cartoon character, I used to have this little caption. It's probably in a file somewhere. Sometime after I'm dead, someone else will find it probably. Ziggy is standing and he's looking at a statue of a Civil War general. And the next frame, he's looking at himself in the mirror. And Ziggy says... Well, it's you and me against the world, and personally, I think we're going to get creamed. Not very encouraging. The Apostle Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Who is he writing that for? For you and me. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Now I can do just one thing or I can do an occasional thing. I can do all things. So Friday, I have lunch with my friend. And I said, Paul, are you still golfing? And he said, yeah, but I'm not very good anymore. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, now my goal is to get into the 70s. <laughs> I never got into the 70s. In 10 holes, I got into the 70s. An encourager. What are you known for? I walked into the home of a parishioner about 20 years ago to hear the mother say to her son, you'll never amount to anything. Guess what that encourage would get you? Her son proved the mother wrong, by the way. Thankfully. Now, I will tell you, at times in my life, I've not been an encourager to people also. And I've not always said the right thing. Still don't. Always say the right thing. You know, B and I share stories. 
of our childhood and growing up years and, you know, what it was like to be a teenager and things of the sort. And one of them I shared with her some time back was, uh, I asked my mother to go do something that I probably knew she wasn't going to allow me to do. But you know how that is. You just hope against hope. And my mother said to me, you know, my excuse was, well, all my friends are doing this. You've never said that, did you, Patrice? <laughs> and my mother said, if all of your friends ran and jumped in the lake, would you jump in the lake? And I said, sure, I like to swim. Wasn't the smartest thing I ever said. And it wasn't really encouraging to my mother. Nor was she to me at that moment. My challenge to you today is this. Sometime this week, send a note of encouragement to someone else. It could be an actual note that you write on a piece of paper. Those are the best. But if you don't feel you have time to do that, send them an email or a text message. Share a note or a word of encouragement with somebody. Two people will be blessed when you do that. The person who receives the note and you yourself. There's a man who wrote a book named Ordering Your Private World, Gordon MacDonald. MacDonald, in this telling of this story, shares that his father was a pastor in a denomination. He's in the same denomination as his father was. His father is now deceased when he tells this story. But his father would come home from conference every year and talk about one other pastor. And these two guys were always at odds with one another, always fighting against one another, always standing in opposition to one another, and all of those kinds of things. And, and McDonald said, my dad has now been gone for a long time, and I'm pastoring a church up in New England, and it's in the middle of the winter, and it's a snowstorm and sleet and hail and, you know, all the pestilence and deadly disease, and it was just one of those days. Ugly days. Snow and sleet mixed together. And he said, we're in the office. And he said, I'm just about ready to pack things up. I've long ago sent my secretary home. And he said, I'm just packing some things up. And there comes a knock on the door. And he thought, well, some poor soul must be out there and stuck in the ditch or stranded or need some help in some way or whatever. And he said, I went to the door and I opened it and there's my dad's nemesis. The guy who fought my dad on the floor of conference year after year after year said, so I, I opened the door and invited him in. I said, Pastor, would you like to come into my office and sit? He said, no. I just wanted to stop. And I wanted to bless you. And he said he reached out his hand and laid it on my shoulder and he prayed for me and for my ministry. One of the most positive and powerful prayers I've ever heard in my life. And when he was done, he hugged me. And he went out the door into the snow and sleet storm and left. made a difference in McDonald's life. What do you want to be known for? A son of or a daughter of what? Heavenly Father, you've come alongside us. 
and you've loved us when we've not been very lovely. You've encouraged us when we have strived to achieve and perhaps have fallen greatly short. You cared for us when no one else has. Help us to reach out in kindness and in generosity towards others, to care for them and to love them in great and in small ways. In Jesus we pray. Amen.